Ministers must perform to keep their jobs. That's according to President Bola Tinubu while declaring open a cabinet retreat in Abuja with the theme emphasizing the need to collaboratively rebuild the economy and instill hope. He also tasked them to prioritize commitment to principles that drive results and positively impact the country's development. State House correspondent Adesua Omoron reports. If you are performing, nothing to fear. If you miss the objective, we review. If no performance, you leave us. No one is an island and the book stop on my desk. A stern warning from President Bola Tinubu to his cabinet ministers. Tinubu also made it clear that performances would be evaluated and accountability upheld. That is why we established Resort Delivery Unit. At the end of this retreat, we are going to sign a bond of understanding between you, the ministers, the permanent secretary, and myself. I've taken a young lady, very dynamic, and this is a to edge that delivery unit. If you have any complaint about her, see me. If you're ready to work with her, stay there. Delivery, yes, we must achieve it. For the sake of the millions of the people, yes, we are talking about the population of this country. What do you do with it? Make it an asset? or a liability. Focus on its progress and come up with bold endeavors. We are great talents around the world. The biggest intellectually sound country in Horn of Africa. Yes, we have challenges in SIA we have challenges of climate change. South and north of Nigeria is battered. We force a surge. You have desert encroachment in the north. But we are still blessed with arable lands. We can do it. We can build our country. President Tinubu emphasizes the need for a forward-looking approach to rebuild Nigeria's economy, restore hope, and foster democratic growth, while accepting both the assets and liabilities inherited from his predecessor. We are not looking backwards. And we are here to make allegiance and give direction to that one family, making sure that relationship can only be stronger if we give hope to our people. But you are there to help me succeed. Success I must achieve by all means necessary. The president reassures foreign investors of smooth returns on investments and underscores the eight-point agenda for economic growth and education, which he says is the best weapon against poverty. Earlier in the IREMAX, the UK and the World Bank reiterated their commitment to supporting Nigeria as it faces significant challenges. This cabinet retreat can start to use the SGF's tracking system to good effect over the coming years to drive delivery to learn from challenges and to move Nigeria forward. Even though we have the word bank in our names, I hope you will think of us as more than a bank. I mean, our real hope is that you will trust us and that we will be able to earn your trust, that we have something more to offer in the nature of solutions to help you think through and then implement uh, the priorities, the focus areas that you've laid out. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation highlights expectations 
of the retreat. The cabinet retreat is designed to prepare and sensitize ministers and other participants on the workings and processes of government with a view to ensuring ministries, departments and agencies, MDAs, deliver on the presidential priorities of the renewed hope agenda for 2023 to 2027. As President Bola Chinubu sets a new direction for Nigeria's development, he is emphasizing a strong commitment to achieving tangible results. The expectations of the public are high on him and his cabinet to deliver on the eight point agenda of renewed hope and development. The clock is ticking. Progress is non-negotiable and there are consequences for underperformance. From the presidential villa, Adesua Omoruan, Arise News. Indeed, as Adesua has mentioned, expectations are high and um, success is non-negotiable. Kaid, it's good to see you this morning on the show. We miss Rufai, and, yes. um, but we, we trust that you will come in nicely. <laughs> so your take on this story, the president has well, the spoken. First, yeah, the first thing is nobody can replace Rufai, just like nobody can re replace Ruben. These are amazing human beings and they have st strong opinion and strong positions and it's always very clear. So what I bring to the table can never ever it's equate to... It's unique as well. It's just unique take as well. So, um, well... With regards to what the president has done, I think the first thing that crossed my mind is the president spoke well. Uh, he spoke eminently well. This is what you expect of a president who is determined to get results. So the good news, he's got Hadiza, Hadiza Bala Usman, fantastic human being, amazing woman. I know her one-on-one -on -one and I know she has the capacity to deliver exactly what the president. So endorsement on that one that the president has done right. But where the issues will be is the fact that the president said he's going to get 50 million Nigerians into job, will provide and create jobs for them at the moment, six months on, starting from the 29th of May till now. Jobs are being lost on a daily basis. So that means the president has plenty of catching up to do in that area. Number two, in terms of the economy, it has not gone north, it's gone south, actually, in the last six months. So there is plenty of catching up to do. Helping business in the ease of doing business, it's south. So everything seems to be turning south, but we are hoping that one of the things that Ruben has said is what is happening? Why is there no retreat so that our ministers understand what they're supposed to be doing? Ruben said it several times. Even Rufai said it. Ayo said it on this program so many times. But it's never too late. It's coming a bit late, but not too late. We're glad that the retreat has happened. The president has made clear what his agenda is. And they have spent time with World Bank, with the IMF, with the British government representative, and other experts who have come into the room to share ideas with our minister. And the president has read out the riot act. You will be expected to perform or you will be sacked. So that is good news. But the issue will still be, is this all talk or just a complete waste of our time? We're hoping it is not all talk and waste of our time. We're believing that the president will do exactly what he has promised. But what we have seen so far does not give us that impression that that's what will happen. So please, Mr. President, look at the number of things that you said you will do that you're not doing and start working on it and let the ministers to work on it. All right. Okay, better late than never. On more than three occasions on this program, I had advocated, based on experience, how that doesn't sound immodest, you know, that the uh, president should have, at the very beginning, organized a retreat for his appointees. And I, I kept making that recommendation because I observed that many of the ministers had no idea what their portfolio was all about. And hence, you find some of them as notably the minister of, uh, I think, Women Affairs, right? Yes. You know, making statements that were completely out of tune with reality. And some of the other ministers quoting percentages uh, not based on research or knowledge. So six months plus down the line, 
the president has finally come round uh, to organize this retreat for ministers, heads of MDAs, presidential aides, and he has given them a charge. I made a point that it's not enough to just say we have a manifesto that uh, people will understand it. No, people have been to be told and given a clear map as to what uh, they should do. So, as I said, better late than never. I will not uh, overindulge myself by saying that uh, I could send an invoice uh, <laughs> to the presidential villa for reminding <laughs> them of uh, what should be done. However, one major thing coming out of that coming out of that uh, presidential retreat, three-day retreat, we're told, focusing on how to restore and redeem Nigeria. The president reminded his own appointees of what his mission is, which is to redeem Nigeria in various areas, enhance growth, back to corruption, for persons who have been saying the president uh, has not been talking enough about corruption. Now, he did at this particular uh, forum taking 50 million people out of, uh, out of uh, poverty. Well, that's quite, uh, you know, a very modest uh, target. 50 million people out of target, out of over uh, 200 million. Uh, however, we hope that what happened the last time, when we were told 100 million people will get out of poverty, you know, will not happen this time around, and that this will be a concrete uh, uh, promise. The president also talked about access to capital. He talked about the rule of law. He talked about ensuring security. All these are very important details. He talks about empowering the youths of Nigeria. Very fine, you know, uh, reiteration of the objectives of his administration. Many of these issues he had raised uh, during the campaign, but it's good to have him on the podium reminding his own uh, uh, appointees. And his emphasis on education is very important. That's one area that many Nigerians would like to see uh, the minister, uh, the president, you know, uh, prioritizing. Now, he said he has, he's establishing a result delivery unit. That result delivery unit is the one that will be headed by Adiz Abala Usman, who is a special advisor on uh, policy uh, performance and implementation. Very good. Uh, result delivery unit simply means these ministers will be given their key P KPIs, key performance indicators. And in that regard, the president made it clear yesterday that these uh, uh, appointees will be made to sign a performance bond, a memorandum of understanding that if you don't perform, you are out. I think that that point should be amplified. A ministerial appointment is not a, it's not a chieftaincy title. It's not a royalty position. You are there to serve. And not to serve people from your village or your state, because that has been a contentious issue. To serve the people of Nigeria in a fair manner. The President Tinubu should insist that what we had in the past, whereby people took almost every project to their, to their hamlet. Some people who are from hamlets, their ambition will be to transform their hamlet into a town. No. Part of the responsibility of that key result uh, uh, delivery unit is to make sure that there's no nepotism in terms of the distribution of opportunities uh, for Nigerians. Well, uh, the president said something that uh, I think should also be remarked upon. He said, borrowing is not a crime. Nobody has ever said that borrowing is not a, it's a crime. I don't think that's what uh, Nigerians are saying. Nigerians are saying that don't borrow for consumption. We're going to borrow money to change all the cars in the villa. We're going to borrow uh, money to buy uh, vehicles for the office of the first lady. We're going to borrow money to buy a yacht. Who, who is that person who is going to use that yacht? They say it's a uh, Navy. Okay, does the Navy need a yacht? A yacht, well, maybe I, I don't understand these things. It's supposed to be a luxury item. And Nigerians are saying that if you borrow, borrow for productivity, not for consumption, not for... Uh, luxurious, uh, ostentatious exhibition by uh, persons who have been elected to deliver on the same key areas that uh, President uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu has identified. I think that point needs to be made, okay? And when we borrow, who is going to pay back? When are we going to make Nigeria a major center of production? We are interested in productivity, not the yacht that uh, big men want to ride or the SUVs that the uh, ones in... Uh, in uh, the, uh, the National Assembly are, are looking forward to. Then, of course, two persons were quoted there, the World Bank 
uh, chief, uh, you know, commending Nigeria about key policy reforms and all of that. And President Tinubu say, oh, thank you, World Bank, for being a good uh, lending uh, uh, partner. Well, the anxiety of uh, major Nigerian economists is that we should be careful how we embrace new liberal economics, how we just uh, suck up to this uh, IMF, World Bank, and lending institutions. That's related to the point I made about borrowing. And then, of course, uh, Mr. Mungmo Mary, the uh, British High Commissioner uh, to Nigeria, I also spoke there and said the government was on uh, a good path. I saw some newspapers playing that up. Okay, what do you expect a diplomat to say? <laughs> he, doesn't, he, lie, he doesn't lie in his mouth to say Nigeria is not doing well. What you can say as a diplomat is simply to encourage uh, Nigeria, at least under the Vienna Convention. Uh, diplomats are not supposed to go to their posts and criticize their hosts. But the president and his team, I, I assume, would going forward also listen to Nigerians because Nigerians have very high expectations. They expect Nigeria to be redeemed. They expect hope. President Tinubu said he will inherit the assets and liabilities of his uh, predecessor in office. Well, <laughs> he should focus more on developing the assets rather than the liabilities. But that's another story for another segment of this program. All right, so uh, finally, the minister's retreat is underway currently. First day yesterday, and it's a three-day retreat, so they'll be wrapping up tomorrow, Friday. And um, a few things, very important things highlighted there by the president. I'm sure they would have a number of facilitators come in to take uh, the ministers through some areas of um, their responsibility. I like the fact that the president touched on the role of civil servants. Because when you listen to a number of ministers um, or um, appointees of government, some of whom go in there to cause a change, try to change culture and behavior, especially in the civil service. They are sometimes resisted by the civil servants themselves. We heard the case of uh, the, gov the Minister of Works, uh, Minister go uh, former Governor Dave Omahi, with regards to timekeeping, being locked in his office because the civil servants were aggrieved. I mean, that's the surface of the story. There might be more underlying issues. But we've heard stories of where uh, a, a, head of a, a minister comes in and his efforts are frustrated by the civil ser servants. And so I think it's important when we talk about KPIs and expectations from ministers that we also look at the culture in the civil service and how we can unbundle that, how we can change that. The head of civil service has a lot on her hands in terms of um, changing that culture, that be the be behavioral pattern in terms of just this attitude of nonchalance and just taking work with levity and sometimes wanting the status quo of unproductivity to remain, hence provoking or perhaps hampering efforts of ministers. So I think it's very critical that when we look at ministries, we also address the situation of our attitude to work, especially for civil servants. I'm not saying all civil servants are bad or that's all that they do. I'm just addressing that critical issue. Now, with regards to the performance of the ministers, I'm really gr glad as well that the president has spoken to the fact that he would he will be taking no prisoners in terms of productivity, in terms of performance, and has actually taken it up so seriously that he's uh, developed or created a unit for um, delivery, for, for delivery, performance delivery, um, the result delivery unit headed by a woman who has a good track record, having headed the NPA at some point, and the um, records that she was able to make in that particular agency. So beyond that, a number of people have called for how do we measure the performances of these ministers? One of which has already um, been talked about is perhaps establishing KPIs for them. And then measures of um, supervision, how often these supervision will happen, what the uh, metrics of performance will be, timelines, so that their expectations are smart, they are measurable, they're specific, we're able to see just how well they've done. He also specifically mentioned the area of education and healthcare. He actually said education is one of the antidotes, loosely translated, loosely quoting him, um, antidotes to poverty in the land, highlighting that there's so much poverty in the land, and that is absolutely true. And to be fair, Professor Taha Maman, who is the Minister of Education, we haven't heard a lot in terms of his 
plans for the education um, um, ministry and what he hopes to do. Of course, it's still early days for some of them, and some of them are in strategy sessions with their team to see how best to address the certain issues. Um, President Tinubu highlighted very specifically the state of our classrooms, the state of the of, of, our, of, of schools in Nigeria, and indeed, as we have declared a state of emergency on food security, perhaps a state of emergency should be declared on education and healthcare. We've had conversations a number of times on some of the key areas that must be looked into when we look at education. We looked at curriculum. We've looked at teachers' welfare. We've looked at remuneration. We've looked at um, infrastructure. We looked, we've looked at exploring partnerships, public um, part, um, public private partnerships, as was done during the Adopt a School initiative to see how we can best improve our educational standards here in Nigeria. And then when it comes to healthcare, Professor Ali Pate has come on. I mean, a lot of people were quite excited when he was nominated or as, as minister and confirmed. And and high expectations for him across the country. Again, perhaps a start where he's strategizing, and, and, and that's usually the best thing to do when you take on a project. Strategize, find out what's your action plan, and then begin to execute. Once this retreat is over, we believe that the ministers will be fully armed to take on the ministries that they've been entrusted with. We looked at Minister of Solid Minerals. What are the plans for that particular ministry? We look at the ministers, the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment. We've been signing a number of deals. What will implementation look like? Let us translate words to action. So those are some of the things. And perhaps there should be a kind a citizen. Um, a, a way that citizens can also give feedback on the performance of these ministers. Maybe a public, um, you know, public uh, uh, um, app or something where people can actually report on how good or how bad it is. We'll move on to our next story. The proposed strike by the Nigerian Labour Congress in Imo State took a different turn as a heavily armed policeman arrived at the NLC Secretariat and arrested the president of the Congress, Joe Ajero. He was later released. Arise correspondent Punarimam Benjamin reports on the developments in Oweri. The Nigerian Labour Congress had planned to shut down Imo State through a proposed strike action. The union had scheduled the following. The protest strike action to take place unfailingly on Wednesday, November 1st. The action be total across all the sectors. Imo State be totally shut down air, land and sea. However, Oweri Airport to remain open till 12 noon before it is shut down. Unions embark on heightened mobilization. After all of this had been carefully planned out, the union converged on the NLC State Secretariat in Oweri to start mobilizing to hit the streets when the unexpected happened. Heavily armed security operatives arrived and reached the president of the NLC to an unknown destination. According to reports, journalists were not spared as some were beaten and taken into custody by policemen too. The union is accusing the government of owing workers and pensioners over 42 months arrears, declaring thousands of workers, pensioners, ghost workers and pensioners, not properly implementing the national minimum wage, trying to use the courts to stifle a lawful protest, attempting to break the ranks of the unions in the state, continually interfering in the affairs of the state council, hiring talks to vandalize Congress state secretariat, observing in bridge agreements the government voluntarily entered into with Congress as far back as 2021. Imo is now charged with a major industrial action. Now, the union says President Joe Ajero has been referred for ophthalmic investigation, a head brain scan, a full body scan, and cervical spine therapy, among other investigations, after being badly beaten before he was taken on a neck collar with wheels all over his skin to the Federal Medical Center, Weary. He should have issued another order, ex parte. Yes. Ex parte. You know, so they kept that letter. They kept that uh, thing they posted to them. Okay. That he said, whether well, do I know that I should? Uh, this thing they can prosecute me about. I say, well, it is the same court that granted this order that can institute a contempt charge. Yes. You know, you can just now start prosecuting. The NLC also says that Ajero's phones, money, and other personal effects were taken away from him. Punaraman Benjamin, Arise News. All right, Kay. The situation in Oweri Imo State, and Punarimam has given quite a detailed report on what's happened so far. 
Your take on the story? Yeah, it, it is quite worrying. Um, the first thing I looked at was the fact that at what point did pe peaceful protests become a crime? Doctor, you're a lawyer, an eminent one. Is there any crime in peaceful protest? I cannot see one. All they have done is converge to have a peaceful protest and to be addressed by the president. The first thing reported by this day in, on this particular issue, apart from what uh, Punarimam has reported, is that some people came with arms and all kind of things to at attack them. These are political thugs who have been hired to go and disorganize their protest, which was peaceful. They ran away. They came back because uh, Ajero was there. They came back to, he came back to address them. And when you come back to address people peacefully, you will not expect that the police will now come into that environment and begin to arrest people. It doesn't make sense, it defies logic. And I love the police. I will always fight for the Nigerian police. I will always support the Nigerian police because I know there are people in the Nigerian police force that are doing eminently great work, that care about Nigeria and that are supporting people. So it is clear that some of them are good, but there are bad eggs in the police. And there are those who listen to politi political leaders and do the wrong thing and don't do it for the sake of Nigerians. So my appeal will be that the police should stop this kind of nonsense. This is absolute nonsense. You have no right to assault. Assault is a crime. Peaceful protest is not a crime. So there is a need for the police to not allow this to go. The Inspector General of Police, my appeal will be to you, investigate this. And those policemen that assaulted Ajero should be arrested and should be put uh, to, uh, to books. Well, on Sunday, um President of the uh, Nigerian Labour Congress, Joe Ajero, had a press conference where he made two points. One was that if the Minister of uh, Labour and uh, Productivity was going to be at a meeting that the Chief of Staff to the President had called to be held on uh, Monday with regard to the uh, eight-point uh, memorandum of uh, understanding that he signed on the issue of the removal of first subsidy that organized labor will not be there. The second issue that Comrade Ajiro addressed was that the uh, protest slated for Wednesday would take place in Imo State and that it was going to go ahead. What are the grounds? As has been uh, pointed out on the screen, non-payment of uh, workers' areas, identify, identification of setting workers as ghosts when they are not ghosts, uh, non-implementation of the national minimum wage, the Imo State government owing, uh, you know, unpaid salary arrears and not uh, doing the very best to promote good labor relations. Well, he kept, he and his uh, uh, members kept to their promise. Yesterday, they went to Oweri, the capital of Imo State, to protest. And it was in the process of that that he was attacked by hoodlums. Now, what do I find curious about this? The first is that nobody is taking responsibility. The police are claiming that, oh, they had to take uh, Ajero into custody, protective custody, to prevent him from being lynched. Who, 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 who are those people trying to lynch him? The state government is saying they have no hand in it. Now, the right to protest is a fundamental right under Section 40 of the Nigerian Constitution. It talks about the right to peaceful assembly. Part of that right also obliges the Nigerian police to protect people when they are protesting. But it will look like in this uh, case, in the way yesterday, the police were playing hanky-panky, which is why organized labor is accusing the Nigerian police of colluding with the Imo State government to allow thugs to harass, brutalize, and dehumanize the president of the Nigerian Labor Congress. Under our commitments, under the International uh, Labor Organization, ILO obligations, this would be a very serious violation. Deknan Nweluba, uh, our colleague, said that uh, it was uh, uh, Comrade Joajero who inflicted the pain on himself. 
because there is a standing uh, National Industrial Court injunction that uh, the Nigerian Labour Congress should not uh, protest. Well, it will be recalled that this same organized labor had said it will not recognize the industrial court telling it not to support and express the grievances of uh, Nigeria. So there is a conflict here. And where do you draw the line? Even when a man disobeys a court order or a group disobeys a court order, is the solution the kind of uh, 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 maltreatment that Ejoro was, uh, was, uh, was subjected to? He even said in his account or in the account of uh, spokespersons for the Labour Congress that he was blindfolded, taken to an unknown destination where he was thoroughly beaten. His uh, right eye was blooded. And uh, in fact, they even used uh, broken bottles to, to, to torture him. So where, where was the police when all of that was happening? So the Inspector General of Police should look into this to see who those uh, hoodlums are and to do everything possible to protect uh, organized labor. I hope we will not get to a situation whereby the Nigerian Labor Congress and the Trade Union Congress will have to go and create their own arm of able-bodied men, of talks, to enforce the rights of workers in Nigeria. However, the residual point will be those grievances raised by labor and on the basis of which a protest you know, uh, was to take place yesterday in uh, Oweri Imo State Capital. And I hope uh, uh, Governor Zodima will have to prove that this that happened under his watch in his state, you know, that he truly has nothing to do with it because it's his name and his uh, administration being mentioned. Well, what happened yesterday in Oweri should be totally and absolutely condemned. Totally and absolutely condemned. A joint statement, you know, Dr. Bati, you'd mentioned that no response, no one is taking responsibility. Police says protective custody. Um, Imo State government says we have no hands in it and it's mischief makers who are trying to join the government in with what happened in Imo State. Even if they didn't have a hand in it, the fact that this happened under their watch is an indictment on both of them, on the police and the government of Imo State. Because if such a thing can happen under your watch, then we have a problem. So if you're saying, okay, we had no hands in it, what was your responsibility whilst all this was happening? So are we saying, Governor Hopu Zodima, that people can come into your state, infiltrate, thugs can come in and have a field day, no security, no protection, nothing. And we just fold hands and say, it's not my fault, I didn't do it. It's an indictment, whether, comp whether directly responsible or not responsible at all, the fact that this happened under your watch is an indictment. And I do agree that the IG of police has um, questions to answer. If policemen are not tear gassing and waterboarding a governor in River State, or I mean security agencies, they are um, manhandling the president of the Nigerian Labour Congress. Let me say something. It's not just Comrade Joe Ajayro that was insulted or brutalized yesterday. He brutalized because of the office all Nigerian workers. It's a statement to organize labor that we don't respect you, we don't regard you, and we'll do what we like and nothing will come out of it. Because if, you know, it's a state of impunity. And that is why we must come out in strong terms to condemn in totality what happened yesterday. Because if this is allowed to happen without any consequences, then the, uh, the organized labor in Nigeria has no, I mean, we can be trampled upon, not anything can happen and nothing will um, take place. Yes, there's an industrial court um, um, ruling against a protest happening. However, I'm, I don't think and I believe very strongly that there's nowhere in the Nigerian um, constitution or laws or penalties or punishment where the punishment for disobedience of a court um, injunction is for you to be brutalized, to be beaten and to be taken away. Nothing like that. So in saying that, that, that it, it just takes away that argument in terms of the fact that they disobeyed the court ruling. So they were ready for him when he you know, came into Uri yesterday to truly show him and beat him. I mean, we saw the pictures, we saw um, what, the way he looked, and that is the president of the NLC. So imagine what happens to the common man in Nigeria. If this could happen to the president of the NLC, then there's no hope for the common man. That's why we had instances of police brutality. We'll hear instances of this and people are just, some people just disappear. If this happens in such a way that it's reported in, in front of a number of pressmen, in fact, some um, um, members of the press were said to also have been caught up in this and some of them taken into custody as well. 
We have to speak out strongly about this. We cannot have a lawless country or lawlessness taking, you know, taking reign in the nation. I'll finally say this by quoting a joint statement released by the TUC and NLC by the um, um, General Secretary. They allege that Comet Ajero was arrested by the police, accompanied by thugs led by special assistant to the governor of Imo State on special duties, Mr. Chin Asawaneri and others like Tape Amadoka. So whilst the police and the government of Imo State have said they have no hands, the NLC and the TUC have come out emphatically to say that they were actually the masterminds behind this. And so we need to get to the bottom of this particular issue. It's a developing story and certainly we'll bring you more updates as this happened. But condemned in totality the show of shame that happened in Imo State yesterday.